is I saw this uh, phrase, we desire bulletproof character. Uh, Lord, we all have uh, so many different areas that we're uh, definitely working on in our character, and uh, we invite your Holy Spirit tonight uh, to do that very thing. Uh, Lord, we uh, are seeking each and every day to be more and more like your son, Jesus, and so help us with uh, who we are, not just what, about what we do, but who we are, uh, especially at the core of our being, um, where our character resides, and so, Lord, we, uh, we pray for help in that. God, as we uh, wrap up this epistle of uh, First Peter, we, um, we just pray that you would speak to us uh, through our, our friend Peter here, uh, who is he's wrapping up uh, this uh, short letter um, uh, still has a number of things. It's, it seems that he looks back on his life and is uh, like writing, jotting these last things down to make sure that he communicates to us uh, for our spiritual walk and the things that, that he learned himself. And so uh, we pray that we'd be able to have those ears to hear and, and feet to be able to respond and move forward with these, uh, each of these things. And so speak to us tonight, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so we're going to be looking at uh, these uh, four things tonight, a staff, a towel, a lion, and a kiss as we, uh, as we roll through this. We're seeing Peter as our role model. Now, if you've heard stories before or you've read stories before, you've read through the different Gospels and we talk about being like Peter, well, if you think about the first part of his life, you're kind of going, I don't know if I want to be like Peter, but definitely there was a change in Peter's heart after the resurrection, once he had been uh, forgiven by Jesus for denying him and he moves into the, the book of Acts and that first half of Acts is about him and how, what God accomplished through him which was absolutely amazing and so uh, writing this towards the end of his life as he's looking back he's uh, reminding himself of these uh, these these real life experiences of, of walking with Christ not what we call an armchair theologian that somebody just learned all of these things in seminary uh, but in fact he walked with Jesus for those three years and and truly learned from the best and so as we go through this short chapter of, uh, of chapter 5 in first Peter here um, We'll see, and we'll see a number again. It's like he's looking back at that time that he spent with Christ and wants to remind us. And so in verse one, Peter witnessed Christ's sufferings. I saw, saw it firsthand is what he's saying there. And then it says he was commissioned to care for the sheep. Uh, that's in verse two. Uh, we're gonna be starting off by talking about the shepherd and, and uh, the shepherds over our different churches and, and who they are and what they should be about and what they shouldn't be being about and and so of course that uh, baton was passed to him by Jesus in John 21 about feeding his sheep and tending his sheep he also saw Christ clothe himself as a servant and humbly wash his very own feet in John chapter 13 and so we're going to talk about that towel and Peter knew what it was to be unprepared when Satan was on the prowl for him Jesus warned him Satan wants to whoop you and he just like, he bl completely blew it off. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. But blows it off and just gets the carpet pulled out from underneath him, as we say. So what's ministry supposed to look like? Before we read our, our section, we'll take these, uh, these four little sections and take them one by one. But, but let's start off with what, what's ministry supposed to look like? And that's what he starts this off. First of all, it's, it's rewarding. It's very rewarding. And then there's the flip side where you see the darkest side of humanity. Over the years, I was thinking about it, I, I became a pastor here. I was ordained uh, 36 years ago, uh, and uh, 34 years ago, I've been here serving the church for 36 years, but 34 years ago I was ordained, and then I took over, I don't know, 32 years ago as senior pastor. And I just think of the different things that I've heard and seen and dealt with through counseling and, and just you see the darkest side of humanity also. And so we say with ministry, you get to experience the highest highs and the lowest lows. Church leaders need to be understanding and forgiving of the people that they're serving, but there's also the inverse, equally important, the flock is to be understanding of the church leaders who serve as their under shepherds. And so we need to have attitudes, attitudes of, of grace and provide a lot of wiggle room for each other. And so that goes both the ways from the, the shepherding staff to the flock and the flock to the shepherding staff. We, we need to give each other the freedom to, to try and fail and to be imperfect. 
and to be oneself. Long-term and effective ministry is never without disappointing dips and unexpected turns. I, I've been accused of wrong motives and criticized my uh, sincerity, uh, sincerity question. I've made my share of mistakes and misunderstood people and judged people wrongly, jumped to conclusions, only knowing one side. But I guess that's ministry in the raw. Uh, Chuck Swindoll said, we are imperfect shepherds leading imperfect sheep in the service of a perfect God who has a perfect plan. I like that. Imperfect shepherds leading imperfect sheep in the service of a perfect God who has a perfect plan. So our outline, again, we're gonna, what, what we can learn from a staff, a towel, a lion, and a kiss. And so our first one we'll read in verses 1 through 4, looking at a staff. The shepherd's staff, verse five, or chapter five, verse one. And so I, exult, I exhort the elders among you. Again, Peter writing to a group of churches, but he's talking to the elders among you as fellow elder, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. He was there at that transfiguration when he saw the glory of Jesus Verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Here's what he's speaking to the elders. And next he's going to talk to the younger, uh, the youngers. <laughs> and so he says here, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. And you'll listen to the not phrases also, not under compulsion, not because you have to, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge. That's an important one right there but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's Jesus, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. We'll pause right there, verses one through four. Shepherds do what? They do two things. They feed, verse two, and they lead, verse three. I've been going through something in myself, inviting our staff to be able to do is looking at our different ministries and, and looking at goals and what are we after and, and what, and, and so it's, it's really been a process where I haven't been kind of goal driven in my life, learning it for myself. I think it's healthy. Then we find ourselves, otherwise, what do you, what do you, how, how do you figure out if you're moving forward in, in different areas of life? And I got a couple days and got away and looked at all the different kind of areas of my life as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as my hobbies that I'm doing, my future, what's up in the future, and, and looking at certain things and, and, uh, and coming up with those. And I've, I'm, I'm enjoying that, that process, but that's ultimately where I found myself as senior pastor, what, what am I supposed to be doing? And it's to be feed, to feed and lead. Now, I, I feed each Wednesday and Sundays and all of that, but that leading side was the area that I've been deficient on as far as finding the vision, searching after that, sitting before God and hearing that. And so that's the area I've been working on. And so then coming up with simply what I could do to be able to make that happen, make it kind of bite-sized to be able to figure out what does that look like and how do I get there. Peter learned this straight from Jesus about being a shepherd in John 21, where as that restoration process, as he denied the Lord three times, Jesus shows up in his resurrected form and speaks to Jesus and says these three things. I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to tend my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. And each of those obviously very pastoral uh, form of what he wants him to do. Somebody said, to love to preach is one thing, but to love those to whom we preach quite another. There's a lot of people that like waxing eloquently and, and trying to get up and stand in front of a group of people and speak, liking hearing themselves speak. That's not the, that's not the point. That's not the thing. Do you love the people that you have the opportunity to speak, whether it's teaching in front of uh, or, you know, our children in, the, in our children's church or in a, in a home group? And I, I think that's a, a great, great reminder there. Pastor Dan and I were driving the other day and, and he had said, I don't know who he picked it up from, but he says, he says, I care more about learning than I do about teaching. 
And he was talking about redoing his counseling and, and not giving more time around the, the tables for people to interact and not just be that lecture style and, and what that looks like because I'm more about learning than I am about teaching. And you really got to think that through. And are we? And really challenge ourselves with that. And whomever we have the opportunity to be able to teach, is it more about you teaching or is it about actually their learning? And that's a great challenge also. A Russian proverb says, No, it says, uh, sorry, it says, without a shepherd, I just want to make sure you guys are still awake. Without a shepherd, sheep are not a flock. I like that. Without a shepherd, sheep are not a flock. Because what are they doing? They're scattered, they take off, they're running in different directions and everything else. And so they, they need a, a shepherd. We realize that, that they, that they can't live on their own out in the wild, right? They, they need a shepherd. And, and so that's why this is used so many times. Back in Ezekiel, Jesus used it, Peter uses it here about this shepherd-sheep relationship. So a shepherd, really elder, overseer, pastor, shepherd, bishop, they all kind of fit in the same category. And sometimes, a lot of times, they're used interchangeably with that. And so simply to tend a flock. Again, it's the basis for our English word where we get our word pastor is from this shepherd. And so we are under shepherds. That's the best way to say it. Uh, looking to the chief shepherd as our inspiration and our, our model. And so he reminds them, hey, turn away your eyes from self-interest to the model of the great shepherd himself, and that is Jesus it's not about you. So any type of leadership role that you might find yourself in, you don't have to be the pastor of a church, but whomever you lead, whether it's your own family, whether, again, it's a Sunday school, whether it's a home study, wherever you lead, even at work, you can take some of these leadership models right into your, your workplace because this is good, solid teaching on uh, those positions. He will indeed reward their diligent care of his people with the unfading crown of glory. And so it talks about this crown of glory. There are five crowns that, that we can get. Okay, five crowns that are laid out for us. And I'll just go through them uh, real quickly. You can see them on the, on the right si side there. In James 1.12, it tells us, it says, uh, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he is tried, he will receive, here it is, the crown of life to those who love him. And uh, so you endure a temptation, you get a crown of life. So that's pretty awesome. So anytime you're thinking, no one else is going to know this temptation, I'm going to look. I'm going to go buy it. I'm going to go, whatever the temptation is. And if you say, you, you talk to yourself, well, no one's going to ever know. The Lord knows. And when you say, no, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do it. That's where he says, James says, James 1.12, you're going to get a crown of life for doing that. That's pretty awesome. The crown incorruptible, that one's in 1 Corinthians 9.25, talking about run, running our race for that eternal prize that a lot of people in the world are running after something else. It's money or whatever it is, but ours is an imperishable crown or an eternal prize, depending on what translation that you use. Then there's the crown of rejoicing, which is you in the presence of Jesus, and that's in 1 Thessalonians 2.19-20. Then the crown of righteousness, <laughs> this, one's, this one's pretty easy. You can get this one too. It's an easy grab. It is simply if you love Jesus' appearing. If you're simply looking for Jesus to come back, right? And so talk about that in your prayers. Say, Lord, come, come, come soon, Lord Jesus. It's that longing for that. Not, not this way, not get me out of this lawsuit, get me out of this situation. Lord, would you just come back? That's selfish. That, that's not nice, okay? It's, it's truly missing him, truly loving him, truly wanting to be with him and crying out for that. You get a crown of righteousness for that. And then here it's the crown of glory for those that shepherd the flock. How far out that goes, like I say, maybe you shepherd a little flock in the Sunday school. Maybe, that, maybe that's it also. But let's keep in mind Paul, when he was uh, talking about uh, one of the crowns back in the crown incorruptible, that, um, again, he wasn't talking about salvation. It has nothing to do with that. Once you are saved, there are rewards that he is going to give us. There are some things in our life that we did, but we did it with the wrong mo motive, and it's going to be burnt up as wood, hay, and stubble, he says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but then there's other rewards that we're going to get, and so he talks about these. And so Paul wants us running to the finish line of life with our sights on winning, 
not just finishing the race. I've talked to a lot of people sometimes of the, larger, the longer races like a, a marathon, and this is what I would be saying, even a half marathon, I just wanna finish, you know, because I'll be trying to breathe out of every orifice of my body, just trying to make it to be able to get there, right? But he's saying as far as life goes and your Christianity goes, what you wanna be after is not just finishing the race, who made it to heaven. When it comes to these rewards, he's saying, no, 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 no. We want you running, sprinting to the finish line. We want you to go for the win is what you ought to be after. And so think about those crowns and, and uh, he is going to be handing those out. I'd like to just kind of read this list that Chuck Swindoll uh, laid out and speaking of uh, leadership positions and I think it's just good, sound, teachable, I, 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 great reminders for us and then we'll Jump into the next section. Remain a good student. Stay teachable. We remind each other on staff this all of the time. Read, listen, learn, observe others. That's something we should always be doing, perpetually learning like that. Remain a good student, stay teachable. Second one, admitting when you're wrong. It's just as important as standing firm when you're right. Admit when you're wrong. Thirdly, lead well includes delegating well. Others will never do things exactly as you would, and that's a good thing. Learn to let things go. Next one, fourth one, don't take yourself too seriously. Laugh often, especially at yourself. Chuck goes on to say, make yourself the brunt of your humor. Point out your own foibles and fumbles. People love when you're human, and that is true. People love hearing how I mess up. They, they love, that's the favorite part of the sermon. People come up and say, that's awesome. Get rest, back off, loosen up. Recharge your batteries, refresh your personal life, keep yourself from running full throttle day after day. And he says, stop repeating statements like I'd rather burn out than rust out. He says, how dumb, either way, you're out. Don't go there, <laughs> I like that. Okay, let's go on to verse five through seven. I just thought those were great. Let's go, we're moving on to the towel in verse five. Peter goes on to say in verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger. So he's speaking to the elders of the church. Now he's right to the younger. You can put yourself in the category if you want to be younger or older. That I'll let you pick. Be subject to the elders and clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Don't try to exalt yourself, that he may exalt you. And then he says, casting all of your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. And I like how the ESV translated that, because it moves from the King James. Cast your cares on him, because he cares for you. And we think, well, that's neat. I like how it puts both of those words in there, but they're two different words in the Greek. And that's why I like that they actually just put it in, put it in there. And so he dealt with the elder believers and now the younger believers. He's saying, clothe yourself, all of you, all of you. Kind of pauses, puts all of us into that category. Clothe yourself, put on the garment of humility. Tie yourself up in humility. It was used of a slave who tied on an apron. Ellicott says it originally referred to a peculiar kind of cape worn by slaves. Thus, it was a badge of servitude. Put on humility. Put on servitude. Put on serving others. I think what came to Peter's mind here as he's writing that is referring back to when he crit witnesses firsthand by, by Christ doing that in John 13, where Jesus rose from the supper, the Last Supper, laid down his garments, took a towel, girded himself, grabbed that water, and went down at their feet, washing their feet. And went to Peter first, right? And where Peter says, not me, Lord. And he says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you won't have any place with me. And he says, well, then not my feet also. Wash my whole body. He's like, no, you go bathe yourself. But no, they didn't say that. But he said no. And so I, I, I'm sure that's what he's coming up. But he, he saw Jesus do that. He, he showed the leader. He showed the chief shepherd well, they should have all washed his feet. He shouldn't be washing their feet. But he saw this incredible example of a true leader doing that. And boy, that was seared into his mind. Of That's humility of a leader. That's the right way to serve. It's not somebody saying, 
Come, wash my feet. That's, no, no. Instead, it's just like, hey, nobody wash your feet. I'll do it. And just gets down and does it. Rather than wait for God uh, to take the initiative and remove those anxieties, notice in verse 7, it's placed upon us in dealing with anxieties that are in our lives. Remove those anxieties that are troubling our hearts or to take responsibility of casting our anxiety upon him. Not just, Lord, take them away, but as you would take a saddle and throw it up on a horse, as you would take something and throw it, it's, it's throwing it onto the Lord. It's, it's taking that initiative to by identifying it and, and casting it upon him. There's a decisive action on our part here, and it's neither passive nor partial. There's a Psalm 55 uh, that says, Psalm 55, 22 says this, cast your burden on the Lord and he'll sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. I remember the, the story, I think it was Spurgeon that told it, of a guy with his backpack walking down this dirt road, old truck comes up, tailgate down, and uh, yells out his window, you want to ride? And the guy's pretty tired and sweat and everything else. So he, uh, he jumps on the tailgate in the back. But as they're going down the road, he realizes that he still has the backpack on. And he tells the guy, he yells out the window, why don't you take your backpack off? And he says, no, 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 I've inconvenienced you enough to give me a ride. I don't want you having the weight of my backpack also. It's like, what are you talking about? I'm, 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 I'm taking all of that weight on my, myself. I'm carrying it. My truck's carrying it. And it's, it's, it's the same with our troubles also. Whether you worry or don't worry, it's the Lord who must care for you. I like this, uh, this phrase there. Jesus is willing to be fully responsible for the things we're anxious about. I really like that. He's willing to do that as he, as he talks about this. It's this beautiful invitation. Please, I want to take your worries and anxieties away. Now let me pause and just simply say, hey, there's, there's some that, that really struggle. Mental issues, emotional issues, whatever else that, that have anxiety to the nth degree. And, and so I'm, I'm in no way saying don't get help from others and everything else. But this is the, the kind of the, those day-to-day -day worries and anxieties of all of a sudden we start allowing ourselves to get kind of worked up over those, those things. So I'm not saying if you have some serious issues with things, it's, it's not trying to be, uh, it's not trying to dismiss miss those in any way or that you're in you know mortal sin if you uh, you know if you ever have an anxiety but but we deal with these we all we all deal with these and Jesus's beautiful invitation is throw them on me put them on my back on my shoulders I can handle these things but I like that he's willing to be fully responsible for the things we're anxious about always so got our next one a lion and verses 8 through 11 be sober minded be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Now this kind of messes with our theology a little bit because we hear of a, a, f a few times where Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we normally hear about him being a lion. But again, Jesus uses a lot of different illustrations or, or illustrations are used in the Bible in different ways. The fig trees use three different ways in the, uh, in the Gospels. And so here we have the devil as a lion here. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So it's a little bit different imagery here. It isn't say Jesus, the line of Judah, who's wait, ready to eat you alive. You know, that, that's not what it says. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's what he's doing. It says, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. It's not just you, not just your area, not just at your church. No, it's throughout the world. Believers are experiencing this, verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And there again, he breaks into that doxology, breaks into that, uh, that praise that's there. And so this, he wants us to have now this image of this lion in our, in our minds. Back in 2018, Pastor Dan and I were in Tanzania and we were teaching up north there and, and we got to do a, a safari uh, in uh, Ngoro, Ngoro. And uh, this 20-mile uh, 
It's inside a 20 mile crater of a volcano. And that's where all of this animal life is, is really incredible. Uh, but uh, we, we came upon this, and it, they're not great pictures because we were at such a distance there, but in the top left one, that's the head of a female lion behind this tree. And there's a wildebeest, which they call spare parts. If you've ever seen one, they, they, they don't look like they go together. But anyways, he, he's just laying there and he's not even looking at the lion. And we're thinking, you're dead meat? And so we're waiting and waiting. Our, our cameras are on top of this vehicle. They're there and we're just waiting for it to go. And our, our fingers are cramping up, waiting. It's 15 minutes. It's 20 minutes. It's getting close to 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, I'll just, I don't know what went on, but all of a sudden the lioness just turned from there and went around the tree the other way. And she starts slowly going around the tree there. And it was just so, I mean, you've seen it on TV or whatever. It was so interesting to see in the wild. But when that lion took the, the first leap, that thing was up on its feet and booked it, and it is fast. And the lion only has a very short burst. She missed him. But then about 10 minutes later, all of a sudden, lions came out of everywhere. There's about nine of them. And then all of a sudden, uh, one of them went chasing one. A whole herd of uh, wildebeest came through, and then they got one. But in this situation, someone is hunting you. And I don't know if we ever think about that or live that life that way, but realizing that every day somebody's hunting you and he lurks in the tall grass and stalking your every move, waiting for a, a moment to catch you or wandering off or dropping your guard, being in a place maybe you shouldn't be. Because when you do, that's when he pounces. He knows your strengths and he knows your weaknesses. Is Satan himself all-knowing? Absolutely not, but he's been watching you for a long time. He sees what you do. He hears what you say. He knows those things. Can he know what your mind, thoughts, life? I don't think so. Again, he's not God. He doesn't have, he's not all-knowing in those kind of things. But again, doesn't have to watch me long to see what my weaknesses are or whatever. And, and so he's, he, he knows how to tempt us. And he's got such a small bag of tricks, but they've worked for thousands of years. And he just keeps using the same ones over and over. And we fall to it so often. So never forget you are his prey. It's why we must remain alert and sober, sober-minded, he tells us. Because if this one purpose is to destroy us, yeah, destroy our testimony, destroy our hope, destroy our holiness, and if possible, our lives. Be aware of his tactics and have respect of his power. And so the devil is an adversary, not a friend. He's a roaring lion, not a playful pet. And Peter remembers the, the time where he thought he was able to defeat the enemy himself. Didn't heed that Lord's warning. It was this in Luke 22, starting in verse 31. You remember it. Simon, Simon, Peter's old name, right? Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you. That's what Jesus says. I'm praying for you guys. This is right before he died, right before he went to the cross. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So it says him by name. He's saying he's asking for all of you, but Simon specifically, that your faith should not fail. And then it immediately says, but you're gonna. He says, so when you have repented and turned to me again, so he's saying you're gonna fail and you're gonna eventually repent, and turn to me again, strengthen your brothers. You're going to be able to teach a lot of people about your failure in this and actually thinking that you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan and yourself and that you don't need my help to be able to help in the spiritual realm. Verse 33, Peter said, pretty pridefully, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you, okay? So he's saying, I don't need your help. I got this. To which Jesus said in verse 34 of Luke 22, but Jesus said, Peter... Let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny me three times that you even know me. The result there was failure and, and, and shame. And so again, we have an old man that has lived this life and he has failed in this area. And so he's begging and pleading with us tonight. I don't care how long you've been saved. He's speaking to each of our hearts tonight. And he's saying, be alert, be watchful, be sober-minded, watch out. He's on the hunt. He's stalking you. Just like that lion there. We have a number of different names throughout Scripture for the devil. The devil, 
That term refers to the slander of God's people. He's a slanderer. Uh, the word Satan means adversary. It's against us. In Revelation 9, 11, it gives us two more turns. Abaddon, it's the Hebrew word for destruction. And Apollyon, the Greek word for destroyer. So just in those four that I've named, there's more. But in those four is slander, he's your adversary, destruction, destroyer. Those are the names, some of the names that describe him to us. You put these labels together and it describes him as dangerous and destructive deceiver who slanders and accuses us at every opportunity that he can. Here's what I think, though, because the church gets lopsided on this and I think is more of a balance of what do we do with Satan. Some uh, underestimate his power. Some overestimate his power. Underestimate. We need to take him very seriously. Just this week, I remembered... And I don't know why I didn't put it on my calendar or something. But for, I'll say the last two decades, September and October is where our church and school get attacked the most. And I don't know why. I used to blame it on Halloween. But I don't know what it was. And I don't know. And these last couple of weeks, we've just been just in our leadership and things that we're dealing with and having, you know, just talking through and things like that. And it was literally, I think it was last night or the night before, I just went, Oh my gosh, we're in October. And normally at September, we'll kind of remind ourselves about this as a staff of just, it's just the, the attacks that, for whatever reason, come our, our way. Matter of fact, can we just pause for a second? Um, Joe, I'm not ending if you're listening right now. Okay, so Father, we just, uh, we, we do. I, I want to s- sincerely put our church and, and school before you because of the crazy things that have been happening in September and October. And, and uh, God, we just put these things before you. And I know I dismiss oftentimes it being Satan, just thinking it's happenstance, just thinking it's life, just thinking it's uh, a normal piece of things. But uh, there seems to be a just demonic level to this. And so, God, we cry out to you as a church and say, Lord, we need your help in these areas that we're working through. Help us with that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Satan's a source of all kinds of pain and suffering in the world, even in the lives of believers, and his activities can be subtle in the forms of temptation, discouragement, or he may unleash fury and tragedy and and destruction. So we can't ignore the potential damage he can do to our physical and spiritual lives. But the flip side of that is not overestimate his power. There's no reason to overestimate Satan's power by believing that anything bad comes directly from him. No. Satan isn't the immediate cause of all suffering and sin. God claims that responsibility at times of bringing on suffering uh, on, on different people, ailments, diseases, drought, calamity, disease, list goes on and on. That God says, I brought that. And so Satan can bring it. God can bring it. Uh, our parents, you know, genetically passed it on to us. We catch a cold from somebody else. Those get passed on, so we don't put it all in Satan's camp. Anytime, anytime anything goes bad in our life. Fallen, depraved human beings can do enough damage to themselves and others without the devil's prodding. And so we have the world system, the world that we live in, fights against us. Our own flesh fights against us and the devil fights against us. Those was what John said. Those are our three enemies there. And I, I don't know why it is that a lot of times we just put the devil at the top of the list. I always put my flesh at the top of the list. I think that's my biggest problem. Attributing too much power or too little power to Satan leads to either overreaction or a lack of preparation. And that's where, again, Peter is reminding us of the preparation part, right? To be able to, uh, to stand firm, to be able to, uh, um, uh, the list that he gave us there to resist him, stand firm in our faith. And, and so he just keeps giving us uh, tips on how to, how to be aware. So what are we supposed to do when uh, we're standing face to face with our adversary, panic, run, surrender, nope, resist him, stand firm in your faith. 
not in your own ability like Peter had tried, but with the unshakable faith in our all-powerful God. James adds in James 4, 7, and 8, hey, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. And so he, he lays it out that way of what we're supposed to do of resisting uh, the devil, but drawing near to God during that time. Lastly, a kiss. In 12 through 14, we'll do this quickly. By Silvanus, uh, uh, a faithful brother. So he's wrapping up here. And uh, what just happened from 11 to 12 is Silvanus. We know him as Silas in the book of Acts. He's the one who has been penning this for Peter. Now Peter is uh, just kind of as Paul would kind of sign his name to the end of his documents is what Peter's doing. By Silvanus, a faithful brother. Like if it was Silvanus still writing, right? Or Silas still running, you'd say by me, Silvanus, but he doesn't do that. A faithful brother as I regard him. I have written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Again, he says, stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So we have this handwriting change, and Peter wraps up with a few cryptic statements there about uh, she, so who is this lady, this city, and the son. Those are the three that we, uh, that we see here. And so there's some ideas about the, the lady, or it says that she, um, putting it in the, that female tense, is probably the church in Rome. I'll explain why in just a minute. The city, Babylon, that is mentioned here. Well, Babylon is modern day Iraq, but uh, Peter's ministry never extended over there or that far to that side. It's most likely a figure of speech referring symbolically to Rome as it was known to do back in that day. His later ministry centered in Rome and that's where a number of believers. And so we're told this name, it, it seems to be a code language for Rome in both Jewish and Christian circles in the first and sec second centuries AD. We have a number of examples of that. We do the same thing with our missionaries or our field workers that are working in a part of, part of the world where we shouldn't be saying their name from the pulpit. So we do the same thing. And so we call them by their first name. We, we, we do a number of different things to be able to uh, help out with that. So we're still doing the exact same today because there's still parts of our world that aren't very Christian friendly. And that's what he seems to be doing here. His son, Mark here, would be the gospel of Mark or the writer of Mark. We call him John Mark, who actually was writing Peter's memoir in, in, the, in, the, in the gospel of uh, Mark is really Peter's story that Mark's pinning it for him. And so there's this beautiful connection there. And it seems that he calls him a son in the faith. Paul always said it that way when he got to lead them to the Lord. So it seems that Peter led John Mark to the Lord and that's who he's, and so it's saying hello from people in his area uh, to these churches that he's writing to is simply what he does at the end. Well, let's wrap it all up with this. We'll invite Joe to the stage and we'll sing with his last song. I'm gonna reread verse 12. We don't wanna miss what Peter was hoping to accomplish in this chapter. So I'm gonna read 12 again. By Silvanus, a brother, as I regard him, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. That's what he's saying. He, I hope you get that. Please get that. He starts and ends this, this epistle with his grace and his peace. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for your grace and your peace, that peace that you have poured into our hearts to be able to help us in dealing with uh, the anxieties of life, that grace that just by the very word itself we didn't deserve, but you've graced us with, like salvation, so many other things. On a daily basis, you continue to just pour that into our lives also. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for this epistle. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's all stand together for our last song. Thank you.